All right, this is our seventh and final set of notes from Chapter 7, um, VLE of Pure Fluids. Uh, in this set of notes, we'll uh, talk about the pointing correction. And so I'll, I'll follow a, a derivation of the pointing correction similar to the text. Uh, remember, there are supplemental notes available. I'll attach it to the screencast and also on our Canvas page um, where I derive the, clock, or the uh, pointing correction in what I think is a much simpler way. Um, We'll talk about its significance, and then we'll also talk about calculating phase equilibria uh, using a cubic equation of state. All right. So in terms of you know pointing correction, so where we're going with the pointing correction is we want to talk about calculating the fugacity of a compressed liquid or a solid. And where this will come in handy is much later on in the second half of the book when we uh, define uh, ideality in solution phases, we, we do in a slightly different way. Um, but typically we define you know, this idealized state as being a liquid, um, a pure component liquid at the same conditions as um, interest, right, or at the same temperature. And so what that might correspond to is if I'm looking at the solubility of a solid and I want to calculate the activity coefficient of that solid, what I'm going to need to be able to calculate is uh, the fugacity of that solid in the same state, which would be a pure liquid at, um, say, 298K, right? And under those conditions, it's typically a hypothetical liquid, right? So it's going to be subcool. Um, so it's, you know, away from our phase diagram. And even when we're dealing with binary vapor liquid coexistence, um, typically we're dealing with reference states that involve um, compressed systems. Okay. And so we're going to, you know, address how to calculate them um, and you know why it's useful um, so that we can make some simplifying uh, assumptions okay and and so where the you know pointing correction essentially comes in is I'm going to take log f okay and I'm going to rewrite it as log f well so log f of my compressed system is equal to log f of my compressed system plus log f at saturation minus log f at saturation uh, and that's just going to be a convenience so then it becomes log F at saturation plus log FC minus log F saturation. And then the goal is, um, is value at saturation. I know that, uh, phi sat times P sat. And then the second term is just going to be an in, uh, integral from um, saturation to my conditions of interest. right? And so take a look at the supplementary notes. So you do it in a much simpler way. Here we'll follow um, how the book does it, which is the gives the same result but might not be as, as clear. Okay, and so when I you know work this out, we're gonna look at uh, condensed phase systems. Uh, and so we'll give a superscript C um, for our properties of a condensed phase. Okay, so we say the D log phi is V over RT uh, one minus P DP. So before we wrote it as Z minus one, but it's the same. Or RT D log phi is equal to V uh, minus RT over P uh, DP, right? Where I factor out the RT uh, and bring it over to the left. All right, so here's our expression we had on the last sheet. Okay, so if I want to calculate log phi C for a compressed phase, okay, I'm going to integrate this from P equals zero to P. All right, I integrate from P equals zero because at constant T, all fluids approach ideal gas behavior. And I know that phi in the ideal gas limit then is just going to be one, right? So I know its value exactly, okay? All right, so I integrate from zero to p, v minus rt over p dp. Okay, so zero is fine, it's gonna be an ideal gas. I'm integrating up to my pressure of interest. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break this integral up into two parts. I'm gonna break it up as the sum of an integral from zero to p sat, and then a second integral from p sat to p. Okay, so here I have zero to p sat, then here I have p sat to p. Okay, now in terms of this first term, okay, um, this is equivalent to you know, log phi sat minus log phi ideal gas. Okay, so the integral of this gives me you know fugacity coefficient at saturation relative to that in ideal gas state. Ideal gas state again I like because phi of an ideal gas is just equal to one. Okay, so log of one would be zero, and this term gets killed. And then I can break this integral up into two parts. So now I have integral from p sat to p of v dp minus integral from p sat to p, rt over p dp. Motivation for this is this integral I can actually do, okay? Remember, this is for a constant temperature process, OK? 
Okay, so R and T are constant then, I can pull it out, and this later term then just becomes, you know, integral of 1 over P dp, which is minus RT log P over P sat. Okay, cool. So in doing so, killing this term and integrating that, I have the RT log phi C is RT log phi sat plus integral from P sat to P, V dp minus RT log P over P sat. Okay, so now starting with this, okay, what we're going to do next is, okay, Oh, actually, did I skip a step? So phi, right, is equivalent to F over P, fugacity of my compressed space over P. So this I could break up to be log FC uh, minus log P. I could bring the log P over here. Um, this negative sign would, you know, allow me to flip the log term. And this reduces to, you know, taking the exponential and, and solving, um, FC, the fugacity of my compressed phase, is equal to P sat times phi sat, times the exponential of the integral from P sat to P V over RT DP. Okay, cool. Or P sat times V sat is equal to F sat. Okay, so, you know, what's kind of the, uh, the significance of this and, and what do these terms really mean? Okay, so remember, this is going to correspond to the fugacity of a compressed phase, right, of a compressed liquid. Um, so let's say I'm uh, water and I know that at, um, you know, 100 degrees C, the saturation point of water is, or saturation pressure is one bar. So at 100 degrees C, I'm at a pressure greater than uh, one bar. So let's say I want to compress or calculate the fugacity of water at uh, five bars and 100 degrees C. Okay. So what this does is it breaks the calculation up into a continuous product of terms or a product of terms. So P sat. Okay. What that corresponds to. Okay. We said this F C is at say five bars and 100 degrees, 100 degrees C, it's in my compressed liquid region. P sat would correspond to the pure component saturation pressure at the same temperature as FC. So P sat would be the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees C, which would be one bar. Phi sat would correspond to the fugacity co coefficient of um, my system, um, and so what this would correspond to in this scenario would be the fugacity coefficient of water at saturation at 100 degrees C. All right, so this would be fugacity coefficient of water um, at saturation at the same temperature as, as FC. Okay, so the product of these two corresponds to the fugacity of my component or my system at the same temperature as my compressed state of interest. So again, if this is at 100 degrees C and five bars, this would correspond to F sat at, um, you know, one bar. Okay, so P sat times V sat. P sat I can readily calculate. Fugacity coefficient would now account for deviations from you know, the ideal gas limit of that system at saturation. And then the second term is what's actually called my pointing correction. So by pointing correction we mean this term, and this is going to account for compressing my liquid from saturation, my saturation pressure to my pressure of interest. So this accounts for the effect of compressing uh, my system. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, and, and so again, the significance is, so this is FC, my fugacity of my compressed phase. As a first approximation, I can assume that FC is equal to my vapor pressure at saturation. Okay. So again, P sat times phi sat is my fugacity at saturation. So, um, you know, F sat, if I assume my vapor phase is an ideal gas, P sat's 1, and F sat just becomes P sat. So if I were to assume that F C is equal to P sat, that's equivalent to, you know, as a first order approximation, I'm going to assume that my fugacity is equal to um, uh, my system at saturation, where I'm assuming that the vapor phase in equilibrium with the liquid at saturation is an ideal gas. Okay, And, you know, where this might be tempting to do so is, you know, PSAT is going to be easy to calculate, right? I have Antoine equations tabulated in the back of my book. I can go look at my constants, and I can calculate PSAT. Not a problem, okay? Then the second term accounts for uh, my first correctional term, okay? So PSAT assumes that my vapor phase in equilibrium with the liquid at saturation at that T is an ideal gas. The fugacity coefficients can account for deviations from uh, ideal gas behavior, right? So first order approximation, then this would be essentially second order, right? If I can calculate phi sat, that gives me my correctional term. 
And then third, point of correction accounts for the effect of compressing my liquid from P sat to P. Uh, so this becomes my now third order approximation, right? My third correctional term um, to uh, my estimate of the fugacity. Okay? And so first, second, third, right? And that essentially gives the hierarchy of, of when I might actually use these things. Okay. Alright, so in terms of um, you know how we generally simplify the pointing correction, as you said, we're interested in a compressed liquid. Okay, and so Here's my pressure versus volume phase diagram. And so what I mean by this compressed phase region, okay, in this PV we call it subquote liquid. And so if I'm at a system at constant T, I'm riding along on these isotherms, okay? And so remember when I'm well removed from the critical point um, in the um, compressed liquid region, um, these lines or these isotherms are essentially vertical, right? So uh, if I were to flip it, dV dP is approximately equal to zero. Um, when I'm well removed from the critical point in my uh, subcooled liquid region. Okay, and so uh, if I assume you know dV dP at constant T is zero, that's the same as my volume is constant, it would allow me to pull it out of the integral along with um, RT, and this just becomes exponential of VC times P minus P sat over RT. Okay, so this is a more common way that you'll probably see the pointing correction expressed. Okay. Now we said in terms of, you know, part of the motivation for writing this is we were able to write our fugacity of our compressed phase as a product of three terms, right? And so, you know, first order approximation is just PSAT, and then we have these additional correctional terms. Okay, so what we want to look at next is, you know, one are these, you know, correctional terms uh, significant, right? And one can I just assume that the fugacity of my compressed phase is just equal to PSAT. Well, let's look at some toy problems. And so what I've tabulated here, okay, is we're going to look at a um, fluid with a molar volume of 100 centimeters cubed per mole, okay, and then what I have in this table is this is P minus P sat in bars, and in the right column is the pointing correction, okay. So this is the pointing correction for a system with a molar volume of 100 centimeters cubed per mole, and what I'm looking at is uh, the deviation of P from P sat, and you know what that corresponds to in, in terms of value. Okay. All right, so uh, for P minus P sat of, of one bar, pointing correction is 1.00405, right? So for most applications, we would say that that is negligible, right? That's essentially one, right? Or the effect or the impact on your result, if you actually calculate it, uh, is, is essentially negligible. If that difference is 10 bars, it's still just 1.0405 bars. So yeah, it has some value, but again, in terms of significance, um, not huge. Um, and then as we crank it up, it becomes more and more uh, significant. So say 100 bars, 1 1.5, 1,057. Okay. So where is your pointing correction um, needed? So my pointing correction is going to be necessary when I'm close to my critical point. Okay, because where I'm close to my critical point, I'm also going to have issues with, you know, um, you know, the volume no longer being constant. But it's going to be at high pressures near my critical point and in excess of my critical point. If I'm at low pressures, so around ambient pressure, then it's typically not an issue. Okay, and to put things in perspective, um, a lot of you are taking mass transfer or separations class now. When you operate a distillation column, right, what pressure do you typically operate these columns at? We typically operate them around one bar, right? The reason being is these are massive columns. It'd be really, really difficult to try and pressurize you know, uh, said column, right? And so when it comes to most of our separation processes, they happen around one bar. And so if I look at this table, all right, you know, we're typically going to be, you know, kind of in this range, right? So if we're typically performing calculations or um, doing or operating around one bar, in general, pointing correction is negligible. Where it's important is if I'm looking at fluids, you know, near the critical point or in excess of the critical point, okay? So, you know, one um, field or popular or important field of study is that of supercritical um, fluids, okay? And, you know, common one is supercritical CO2. It's this nice environmentally benign green solvent. Uh, and, you know, an application you may know of is the use of supercritical CO2 to extract caffeine from coffee. It's how you make uh, decaf coffee, okay? And so supercritical CO2 is, you know, was previously a huge hot uh, field of study. Uh, academically, it's died off a little bit, 
Um, but there, you're dealing with systems at extreme pressures. So if I'm analyzing you know, a system that involves supercritical CO2, pointing correction is going to be important. I am looking at vapor-liquid coexistence in a distillation column, and it's not going to be so important. Okay. The second correctional term was fugacity coefficient. Okay. And so if you look at fugacity coefficient, what I've plotted here is this is fugacity coefficient uh, versus reduced temperature. Okay, and you know in general, again, if you know I'm at uh, temperature such that PSAT is low, uh, say below one bar. So if I'm around one bar, PSAT's uh, virtually going to be uh, equal to one, right? Assuming that my vapor phase is an ideal gas, is in general going to be an extremely good um, approximation. And again, for most cases, this is fine. Our distillation columns operate around one bar, um, and so assuming that my vapor phase is an ideal gas, will many, many times be a very good approximation, okay? But what I've plotted here is fugacity coefficient versus reduced temperature, okay? And, um, you know, and, and so this is at um, uh, saturation. And so if I look at methane up near the critical point, so reduced temperature one, it's, you know, say about 0.7. And then as my reduced temperature decreases, okay, so as I move down my coexistence curve, uh, my value uh, increases, you know, getting closer to one. If I consider water an extreme case, all right, it starts out at some value, say, um, I don't know, between 0.7 and 0 0.6, 0 0.65, and then as my reduced temperature decreases, it goes close to 1. Okay, So as long as I'm at conditions well removed from my critical point, so if I'm operating around ambient conditions, uh, chances are I'm going to be you know, well down here. Okay, I'm going to be, um, you know, and it, it's difficult to compare water and things like nitrogen, right? This is my my incompressible gases and so you know, comparing critical points in that are a little more challenging but in general if I'm designing a distillation column and op operating around one bar assuming that my vapor phase is an ideal gas not a problem okay um, where this term typically needs to uh, be used if I think in terms of distillation and separation processes uh, is when I have self-associating fluids okay and so Remember, the assumption of an ideal gas is molecules don't interact and they don't take up space. So when I'm at you know, low pressures of, say, one bar, the space in between those molecules is you know, so large that it's reasonable to assume that the molecules don't see each other and don't interact. Exceptions to the rules are typically what we call uh, self-associating fluids. So something like a uh, molecule that contains a carboxylic acid group. Right? Carboxylic acids are known to uh, self-associate with each other. Right? And so what happens is in the vapor phase, you end up forming things like dimers and trimers, uh, etc. So acetic acid, uh, when you look at the vapor phase, you're not going to have isolated acetic acid uh, molecules, but rather you're going to have associated clusters. Okay? And so in cases like that, assuming fugacity coefficient is negligible, uh, is not good. Uh, and there's methods actually out there, things like Hayden-O'Connell, um, which can use to be used to model that association in the vapor phase. Okay? Cool, okay. So now in terms of calculating fugacity coefficient, um, so we looked at this in the last chapter, right? We have, you know, simple equations that we can use to calculate um, fugacity coefficient using an equation of state, right? And, you know, I guess I should pause and say, okay, that's pointing correction. Now we're transitioning to recalling what fugacity coefficient is, and then we'll look at how we can use that to calculate uh, phase equilibria. Um, yeah, okay. So here's my equation for fugacity coefficient from the last set of notes right, for a cubic equation state. Now I'm looking at the PT phase diagram, and so ultimately we want to essentially calculate this using the equation of state. So here I've plotted pressure versus temperature, and then the straight line is uh, my coexistence curve. Okay. And um, you know if I have a system at a binary, so single component system at two component phase equilibria, Gibbs phase rule tells me I have uh, one a degree freedom. So if I were to specify, say, pressure, and I'm at coexistence, then my temperature is fixed, right? Or if I specify temperature, I can find where I am in my coexistence curve, and pressure is fixed. All right, so now let's talk about how we can go about um, mapping out P versus T phase diagrams using uh, a cubic equation of state. And you know, not only P T phase diagrams, you can calculate everything. P T is just easier to visualize. So at um, two-phase equilibria, I have equality of temperatures, pressures, 
molar Gibbs free energy or chemical potential or fugacity of my phases at coexistence. Okay. When I have a pure component system, only for a pure component system, okay, my fugacity uh, can expand out as fugacity coefficient times vapor pressure, and I can you know, write my equality of fugacities as an equality of fugacity coefficients. I emphasize this is only correct for pure component systems. When we have mixtures, right, I would need to input you know, mole fraction in component one and a mole fraction in component two for the species I'm writing this for. Okay, so at phase coexistence, I have an equality of fugacity coefficients. Okay? So if I think in terms of PT phase diagram, you could already start to think about how you might be able to go about using a cubic equation of state to map it out. Right? Specifically, right, if I specify temperature, right, then in theory the thermodynamic state of my system is fixed. In terms of fugacity coefficient, and I think of my equation from a cubic equation of state, I specify temperature and pressure, I can calculate fugacity coefficient. So if at coexistence my fugacity coefficients need to be equal, what this you know, can turn into is, okay, I'm going to specify T, and then my goal is to solve for the value of T, or not T, P, so that my fugacity coefficients in those two phases are equal. So specify T, then guess values of P until my fugacity coefficient in the two phases are found to be the same. Okay. So again, um, if I have a pure component system at vapor liquid coexistence, I have equality of temperatures and pressures. So first step is either going to be to specify temperature or pressure, right? And so I could think of it as if I'm setting up my data and say an Excel sheet, my um, x, my column of my x's, my independent variable will either be p or t, and then with that I want to calculate the other. Okay. And I need to specify one because according to Gibbs phase rule I have one degree of freedom. Okay. And so if we go with the route of specifying t, right, the procedure would go as I specify t, and then I'm going to essentially keep guessing values of p until I solve for my fugacity coefficient of my liquid and vapor and find that they're equal to each other. All right. Cool. Okay, um, in terms of coming up with guesses of P, uh, that could be a little tricky, but you know you could use techniques like that simple uh, vapor pressure equation. You can use that to get an estimate of P and maybe start there. Okay. Um, so again, if you know, fugacity coefficients are equal for given P, you know, congratulations, you're done. Otherwise, you need to guess a new value of P. Uh, the rule of thumb given in the text uh, is that essentially your system will prefer the phase with a lower uh, fugacity coefficient. So if the fugacity coefficient is lower in my vapor than the liquid, okay, what that means is I need to you know, lower the value of my liquid. And so how I'm going to push myself towards the uh, liquid phase is I'm going to increase P. Right, so if fugacity of my vapor is less than fugacity of my liquid, I increase P so that I can you know, tilt those uh, uh, arms of justice, uh, if you will. All right, and you keep doing uh, until uh, it's solved. Okay? And that's what we'll do in our first project, uh, which we'll talk about in class. Um, that's kind of cool. So if I know critical temperature, pressure, and eccentric factor, that's enough, armed with a cubic equation of state, to be able to map out, say, my PT phase diagram. Right? And if I know you know, T and PSAT, uh, that's enough to calculate every other property I could possibly want to know uh, via my uh, cubic equation of state. Okay, so that is uh, pretty awesome. Okay, so that's the end of uh, this first half of the book on pure components. Uh, next, we'll move on to mixtures.